about a story. Okay. Yeah. When, <laughs> when I first started dating my now wife, she invited me to a barbecue at her cousin's house. Okay. And she was like, listen, I know how you get. You like to tell stories. You like to get in the mix. My cousin played basketball. Don't make it a thing. I know you like basketball. You think right. you're good at basketball. Right. But you don't have to be competitive. How and long are y'all dating at this time? Like two years two at that years. point. Gotcha. So, and I had met most of her family, but I was meeting her cousin for the first time. Oh, shit. And I was kind of like... And so for people that don't know, too, yeah. your fiancé at this time? Your girlfriend at this time? Yeah, my, so my fiancé at the time. Fiancé at the time. So... Woman of color. Woman of color. Shout out, queen. Yes. All right, go ahead. So I'm like, what am, I'm not going to make a big deal. I'm not going to challenge him to a one-on-one -on -one game at his barbecue. I'm like, <laughs> right. you're being strange. Right. So we get to his house, whatever. I walk in, and her cousin is Chris Bosh. What? Yes. He, Miami Heat? Miami Heat, Chris Bosh. So I'm like, definitely not challenging him to one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> right. And so I'm like, okay, play it cool. So I'm a humongous basketball fan. <laughs> Love the NBA. Unfortunately, I've been a Knicks fan my whole life. Ah. And so... I'm like, just don't bring it up. Just don't even, whatever. Right. So I meet him, super cool, sitting in this circle with him. Dwayne Wade is there wow. and a bunch of other people, right? So I'm, I'm just like, on the inside, I'm like screaming. Right. On the outside. Y'all at his house. Yeah. On the nice. outside, I'm just like. <laughs> Being cool. 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 <laughs> so they're talking about something basketball related. I don't remember what. And the guy next to me, who I don't know, who's not a basketball player, says, I played a little basketball, and he's talking about his stats and where he went to college and everything. Mm. And then it was kind of like my turn in the conversation <laughs> to speak. And I, as soon as I said this, I was like, what are you doing? I was like, I played a little ball. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, what are you doing? Right. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> right. You're breaking the first rule. Right. Play it cool. Right. So they're like, oh, yeah, like, like where, what? <laughs> and so immediately I'm going through, like, my Rolodex of stats, and right. I'm like, well, you know, not that many impressive accolades in my basketball career. So I told them about the time I got my finger cut off at freshman basketball practice. Damn. And as I'm saying this, I'm like, what are you doing? Stop talking. Because I can <laughs> see their faces start to turn from interested into what I had to say, like, whose man gruesome. is this? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm in the story, so I can't stop. Wow. So when I was a kid, I made the freshman basketball team. It was super exciting. And we had this coach who had played, I forget where he played, but he played with guys like, uh, Bobby Hurley is a kid who okay. played for Duke and, uh, and some other really great basketball players around New Jersey. So I don't know why, but we got bused to a middle school every day for basketball practice with no supervision. Hmm. And we would practice or warm up for like 20 minutes. And by warm up, I mean sit around and, and screw off and do nothing <laughs> yeah. until the coach came in. And then we would pretend we were sweaty running around. So he's like, wow, these kids are really self-motivated right, go-getters. Right. And so... One day we were practicing, and the school had a school dance that night. So they had, uh, they had banners everywhere, and they didn't have those blue mats up or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And so we're practicing, and we had, the night before we had lost by 20 points, a game we should not have lost. So our coach made us run for like an hour straight. Yeah. And we were doing this drill where we all line up on the baseline, and he would throw the ball, and your job was to sprint, catch the ball, make a layup. If you dribbled, you had to run sprints. If you missed a layup, everyone had to run sprints. Wow. So I was like, where Coach I'm from, Carter out there. Yeah, where I'm from, <laughs> if, if you make everyone run, you get beat up in the locker room. Damn. So I'm like, I'm not getting jumped in the locker room, so I'm getting to this ball. I don't care. <laughs> so, of course, my turn comes. He throws the worst pass of all time. Uh, it bounces under the hoop. So I'm figuring, all right, I'll jump, knock it away from the wall. I'll run sprints. Everybody will be cool. Right. So I run. I hit the wall. I knock the ball away, and everyone's just staring at me. And I'm like, why is everybody staring at me? This is weird. And I look down, and my finger comes off into my hand. What? Yes. What? Half, the top half of Which my ring, the top half of my ring finger what? gets severed because the thing that raises and lowers the, the hoop wasn't covered by those blue mats. Oh. Yeah. Which I. Which, in hindsight, my that mom. That goes on the wall alongside my, the yeah, wall. Yeah. My mom and dad should have sued the school, and I'd be a millionaire. Right. And they didn't. So maybe I should go to therapy for that. Yeah. Still have some <laughs> pent up resentment that they didn't do that. Damn. So I come down panic obviously and i run to the bathroom so i'm putting water on this which is apparently the worst thing you can do because it's just water going on the bone of my finger uh. and it's stinging my coach comes into the room now this is like a six six power forward yeah. of a coach and he's like oh suck it up you just cut yourself looks at my finger faints Damn. so i'm like i need an adult right. <laughs> so none of these kids who are 14 13 can help me so I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do? Right. Before cell phones. Right. I'm at a middle school. So all of a sudden, my dad walks in. And I'm like, what are you doing here? It's random? Yeah. 
So he was a teacher in New York City, and he was on his way home from work, and he was like, I'm going to stop by and see if they're practicing. Shout out to good fathers. Hell yeah. So <laughs> randomly, he sees my finger. He's like, we got to go. So he gets me in the car, and I lived a block away, and he goes to my house to tell my mom, what? We got to go to the hospital. Okay. So my mom is pulling into the driveway, and she gets out, and she's like, I just got my nails done. And we're like, there's more important things happening. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, my dad says to her, we're going to the hospital. And she goes, which one is it? Because I have an older brother, right? And every, mm -hmm. it was either he broke bones and I got stitches, we'd go to the hospital. Right. And she was like, he was like, it's Ben. He's like, so she says, how many stitches? And he's like, a lot. He got his finger cut off. And she was like, all right, I'll meet you there. Just nonchalantly, like yeah. no big deal. Like, so, is this normal? Normal, right? right? So we go to the hospital. I get there. And the doctor says to me, we need a plastic surgeon. I can't, nobody here can do this. You, we're going to have to either get a skin graft, right, from somewhere else, but then there's a chance of infection. You could lose your finger, or we're going to have to get a plastic surgeon to reattach. Now, keep in mind, I'm telling this story to Chris Bosch, Dwayne Wade, right. and all these other strangers I've never met. Right. And as I'm telling the story, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Right. You psycho. <laughs> right. Stop talking and change the subject. Bring up anything else. Right. But, but I you've keep, already committed. I'm plowing through. Yeah, I'm yeah. plowing through because yeah. I'm, you know, I got to, I got to finish this story. Right. So, I'm at the hospital. They're like, we can't give you any painkillers because you're under 18 and there's nothing strong enough that will make you not feel your finger. So we're going to give you lidocaine, which is what they give you for like dental work. Wow. So I'm like, cool. So they numb my finger and they, I had to wait two hours for a plastic surgeon. Plastic surgeon gets there and says, we have a problem. We need the original skin or you're going to lose your finger. We have to cut your finger off because if you graft the skin, from somewhere else, like the leg, and it's uh, large and it goes on the finger, it could get infected and then spread. Wow. So Where the were, hell is the original skin? So, <laughs> my brother, who was on the varsity basketball team at the time, my dad had to go to his practice, pull him out of practice, go back to the middle school and get my skin off the wall Holy and bring shit. it to the hospital. They went on a skin hunt. They went on a skin hunt <laughs> with saline solution. Damn. Yeah. So they get the skin, go back to the hospital. So now I'm trying to, you know, I'm high as a kite from this lidocaine <laughs> and I'm talking to this guy like he's trying to reattach someone else's finger. Right. So they get this skin and they like kind of mm. roll it out and like almost look like a paper mache. Wow. Right. And they put it on my finger and he takes this this giant like black, almost look like licorice stitches. Right. Those old stitches. Not now where like they can super glue your finger yeah, back together. Yeah, yeah. And they go through my finger and I'm like, are you done? And he was like, oh, no, we have 200 more. What so I was there for six hours, oh. and they super glued my finger back together. Not super, stitched it back together, oh, right? Hell. And then, this is the best part. You're like, what else? So since I cut another part of my finger, they had to do stitches on that finger. Damn. So they did 100 stitches on that finger. I get home. They tell me, you cannot sleep laying down. Because if you sleep laying down and your arm hangs, the blood will rush to your finger and pop the stitches. You'll lose your finger. So they put me in a sling and I had to sleep like sitting up like friggin' Hannibal Lecter, wow. like a lunatic for two full weeks. So Shit. I can't play basketball anymore. I don't even know if I'll be able to play baseball, which I was actually good at. Right. I get back to school. I took like a week off. I go back to school and I'm all depressed. And we have a substitute teacher in Spanish class. And it's some white dude who's like, hola, Benito, which <laughs> is so strange. Right, and like right. the most cultural appropriation. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, right, like really, yeah. this is who we yeah. had to go. And I'm like, I don't know you. Like, why are you talking to me? He's like, right. oh, I heard about your finger. It's so bad. How are you going to finger girls now? What? I'm like, shouldn't you be teaching us Spanish? What? He's like, I need an adult. This is not, what? who is this clown? <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm telling this story to all these people. And I realize everybody's been listening to me for like five minutes telling this story. And they're just staring at me. And I don't, I don't know how I'm going to end this story because I'm like, this is not a nice story. Right. It's a pretty gruesome story. So I was like, I turn, I turn to Dwayne Wade and I'm like, so you play basketball, huh? <laughs> That's how you ended <laughs> That's it? That's how I ended the story. Damn. Which was the worst way to end that story. Hell of all time. They, after yeah. you walked up, I was like, who? So, <laughs> so after that, I go to my fiance, my wife now, mm -hmm. and I'm like, so what do you think? Do you think... I like, do you think he likes me? And she was like, I can't believe you told that story. Damn, lunatic. Damn. But it worked out. It was cool. We're cool now. And, and wow. I guess uh, he stuck with me. I'm part of the family now. So. Damn, yeah. that's dope. Yeah. Damn, that's dope that y'all got yeah. past that shit. Because yeah. I'm sure they were probably the first like, what the fuck? Oh, they're like, who the fuck is this lunatic? Damn. Like, who invited this guy? How's the finger now? Shit, it looks uh, like it healed up well. It's good. Sheesh. No problem. Yeah. Damn, that's wild. Yeah. And this was high school. Yeah, freshman year in high school that happened. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Dope, mm -hmm. man. 
So from high school, obviously years forwarded, mm -hmm. you're still with your love with the love of your life. Yeah. At what point did stand up comedy come into play? Yeah, I uh, I started doing stand up about 18 months ago. Well, pre COVID, 18 oh, okay. months ago. Okay. Yeah, okay. 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 So short time. How the hell did you just stumble on a stand-up? Well, I'd always wanted to do it my whole life. Like okay. when I was 16, even before that, I watched SNL with my mom as a kid and always loved, you know, Steve Martin, Martin Short, yeah. uh, you know, then eventually Will Ferrell, those guys. And I thought, yeah. and I love Chris Rock, you know, uh, yeah. Chappelle, like all these Definitely. legends, Bill Burr, Louie. Yeah. And I was like, I want to be like those guys, but I didn't really have the balls to do it. Yeah. And I was too nervous and afraid. And my dad had died right when I was about 16. Mm. And I kind of became this introvert, mm. even though I wasn't. I was really an extrovert, but I, I kind of retreated into myself because I was too afraid to be vulnerable. Right. And so stand up to me was like, oh, you got to be vulnerable and say some real shit. That's scary. Right. I don't want to do that. That's a scary. That's why a lot of people don't do right. this. Right. So yeah. I started to learn how to write because that was safe to me. I could hide behind the screen or the right. words or the page and people could still enjoy it, but I wouldn't have to like be myself. Right. And so then, you know, fast forward a couple of years, I was like, I want to move to LA and I want to try stand up. And I came out here, I did maybe a handful of open mics and was like, I suck at this, I'm not doing it. Right. And then I got into screenwriting and I really started to learn the rules and fundamentals of writing and comedy. And I was like, you know what? You gotta do stand up. That's what you wanna do. It's now or never. Right. And then I, I stopped putting so much pressure on myself and I thought, you're gonna fail. You're gonna bomb. You're right. gonna be terrible. It's a part of it. Until you're not. Right. And so just keep failing upwards. And I just had so much fun with it. It took the pressure off. I started to have a little bit of success and felt like because I didn't start when I wanted to was the greatest gift ever because mm. I didn't know shit. Mm. I was like a stuffed animal. I had no life experience, you know? <laughs> right. And I started later in life and I was like, well, I actually have some life experience. So I'm gonna start to try to say some real shit. Right. And I noticed people would, you know, kind of resonate towards that or yep. relate to what I was saying and, or, you know, appreciate it. And now I was like, this is a lot of fun. I'm really enjoying it. That's dope. Yeah. I think that's the coolest part about this whole process for me is too, it's like, I know because I've been, you know, married and shit for so long. Sometimes mm. you feel like you're missing out on an opportunity to work and to build and to create yeah. because of your relationships or because of where your life just is. Yeah. But a lot of times that's where your material and your yeah. experiences come from. I mean, from. I'm lucky. I've been with my wife now for a year, a little more than four years. Nice. And she's been incredibly supportive and nice. pushes me to get up sometimes when I don't want to. Nice. She's like, oh, it's a Tuesday night. You should you should hit an open mic or get on a show or do something. Damn, man, she's yeah. supportive. Yeah, she really is. And nice. she makes me better because I'll run bits by her. And she's like, that's not funny. That's and she's it. like, you know, she's really direct and honest. Dumb. And I really appreciate it because a lot of people, I think, especially out in L.A., right. they won't tell you the truth. Hell no. Let's talk about you after you leave. Yeah. And so once once you kind of get somebody who really tells you the truth and has right. your best uh Interest. Interest at heart. Right. You can really succeed because you, you stop being afraid. That's dope. And so she's really been a tremendous rock for me dope. because she's always pushed me to be better and makes me want to just try as hard as I can. Ben. Yeah. You know you're getting some ass after this episode. I, I have better. Right? You know you're I getting mean, some ass, right? Yeah. She's listening to this shit right now like, tell them, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You better testify, yeah. right. bitch. Hell yeah. yeah. That's, <laughs> That's so dope. Funny. That's dope. No, it's, it's good, man, to hear you uh, acknowledge, you know, your woman because... You know, we don't do that enough, you know, That's as true. guys. And just hearing you say that mm -hmm. puts me in the perspective of my wife, too, because she's my biggest critic. Yeah. And sometimes it can be frustrating because mm -hmm. we, as comedians, we're sensitive about our shit. Yeah. So we want that gratification. Yeah. We want that love because we get that in yeah. the streets a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But to have that critic and to have that raw uh, opinion. Yeah, and, man. and you forget, too, like I would run bits by her and do them at a show or at a club, and you've done that bit a hundred, a thousand times, however many right. times, and you get all this validation from a crowd, right. when that person had to sit through all of it being terrible and working itself out, right. they deserve a lot of the credit for listening and giving feedback and constructive criticism and all that kind of thing. Yeah, that's why yeah. Dr. Dre wife won a hundred billion dollars a month now, because well, she played a part I mean, in listen, him building, you know what I'm saying? Listen, if she could <laughs> prove she was in the gym with him shooting free throws, oh. then she deserves the money, you know? Big facts, that's, that's right. where it's at, that's where yeah. it's at. So it's if y'all sweat, sweat equity, so I so there's no need me even asking you. Right. Should you hit you know the million dollar, yeah. which I'm sure you will at one point. I hope so. She's gonna be entitled to that to yeah. that money, right? right. Absolutely, right, right, right. absolutely. I mean, look. Right. hey sis, you owe me yeah. some money, and just in case it comes to that, you yeah. come back to Charlie and say, yeah, Charlie wasn't solidified. The way I look at it, <laughs> right? The way I look at it, and mm -hmm. the reason why I chose her is because I could trust her, mm -hmm. and because I felt like I wanted to build mm -hmm. something with her instead mm -hmm. of just build something by myself. And you're tagging along for the ride. Right. I don't want to just be good at comedy for me. I want to be good for my family. Right. So she is my family. So if I'm good at comedy, it helps both of us. Thanks. And, and vice versa. If she's great at acting and producing and being a creative, which she is, it helps me. Right. So I, I don't want to be successful and alone. Right. You know, that's not, 
To me, that doesn't sound fun. Right. That's yeah. a whole message. That's a whole topic in itself. Yeah. Being successful dropping, alone. We're dropping gems. We're dropping here. gems we're dropping on y'all last <laughs> today. Because a lot of Hollywood, I feel like there are a lot of lonely, successful people here. Well, so I think I think part of it is you have to make a lot of sacrifices. Yeah. Especially when you come out here and you want to do what you want to do. Right. And I, I certainly made a lot of sacrifices. I left every single person I knew from the East Coast, where all my friends and family were, wow. came out here, and I knew one person. Wow. And you just suck it up. If it, if it means a lot to you, you'll figure it out. Right. And if you really want it bad enough, you'll you'll make it happen. Or you won't. And that's fine too. But you got to come to that moment, everybody does, who wants to be in the creative arts. I think you come to that moment where you're like, how bad do I really want this? Because right. I could quit. It's so easy to quit. Right. Definitely. And, it, and it's also so easy to be good at something. It's really, really hard to be great at something. Right. And I think that line between being good and being great mm -hmm. is not, it's not a thin margin. It is, it's Mount Everest. Mm. And I think the, what separates it is your work, work ethic, your daily habits, right. the way you think, how positive you are, right. how you uh, react to failure. Right. Because it's not a straight line. We know this. Hell no. Yeah. It's ragged and exactly. jagged and mean. Right. And disrespectful sometimes. Yeah. So to have a partner there that kind of understands that. Mm -hmm. And it took a while, too. I know y'all, you know, when y'all met, you weren't doing comedy. Right. Mm -mm. Okay. So this is a new thing that she so had to get sold on. She as did. Well. Yeah. Because yeah. she's like, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> date you, knowing I was dating a comedian. Right. You know, I was doing personal training and strength and conditioning and oh. writing on the side, and then writing started to become more of my full time gig. And then I was like, I want to do stand up. Nice. And uh, she was like, Well, I support you. Nice. Uh, but I don't. I and I don't know if she thought I'd be any good because I never really talked about it. It was kind of like my private hobby that I loved right. watching comedy and that kind of thing. And then I was going to clubs, and she saw how hard I was working. And I think my first year. I did maybe like I got up like over 150 times, 188 times. Nice. Because I had looked at I had looked at the guys and the the women I admire, and I was like, well, what did they do in their first year? How many mm -hmm. times did they get up? Because right. they were open micers. They right. weren't you know passed at a club. Right. So I was like, well, I got to get up at least double what they did. Damn. If I want to be as good as them. Yeah, that's a lot of work. And so I even working a full time gig, I was like, I'm getting up. I mean, my goal was 200. I did 188 times. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, that's solid, man. Yeah. Shout out to the queen. Yeah, that's been supportive all this time, yeah. man. That's kept you going, man. Is yeah. it uh, obviously she plays a big part of your motivation? But yeah. is there any other motivating factor that you think kind of keeps you going? Because the yeah. business does, you know, it, it it can slap you around a little. Well, bit. you know, I think what motivates me is uh, one first thing for sure is there's so many funny, talented people doing comedy, right. and there's so many funny people that I know that I see them and I'm blown away by how good they are, and I'm like, fuck, I want to be good right. or better and not in a jealous kind of way more in like you're inspiring me to be better than Hell i am yeah. you know like and i see you put out a clip or I, i've seen you do stand up and i'm like fuck man yeah i gotta go home and write yeah that's me literally yeah. every time i go to a show yeah. it's like damn he is killing I, I, you know i don't want to hate on, on you i want to be like damn i want to fucking write and be better than you yeah because i want you to come to my show and say fuck i gotta write exactly. so like that inspires me is there's so much talent here the second you get lazy you're a dinosaur you're dead right you're done yeah so i'm kind of like that the fear I think of not being great motivates me to work my ass off. Nice, yeah, you know, big facts, man. Yeah. So obviously, you know, 2020 has been a <coughs> hell of a year. It's been interesting, right? There's been yeah. a lot of you know twists and turns, yeah. man. Uh, there's a big difference in how we do everything, man. How have you been taking this time and adjusting to yeah. not being able to get on 170 been, stages, maybe seven yeah. this year? It's been like, a weird, it's <laughs> been a roller coaster of emotions for sure. Yeah. In the beginning, I thought, well, okay, this will last maybe one to three months. We'll right. be done with it. We did the right thing, and now we'll move forward. And you know, here we are in October, and a lot has changed. I got married in August, which was great. Right. We we were supposed to get married in Texas. We had to switch it up and get married in L.A. in a backyard via Zoom, but it nice. was it was amazing. Right. So that kind of, honestly, if I didn't have that, I think I would have been very depressed with all the idle time. Mm. But that really occupied a lot of my time and a lot of my thinking. So it kind of allowed me to be happy yeah. and have a happy 2020, right. as opposed to a lot of other people went through some real serious shit. I was very Definitely. fortunate. You know, I didn't, I personally didn't go through so much shit. So it's been tough not doing stand up and not being able to like creatively express myself right. but it's been also interesting exploring the digital space making sketches trying to write jokes and see what the reactions are on social media right. seeing kind of what the future holds for comedy and stand-up in terms of the digital age right. um, being inspired by people who are doing like amazing things in the digital space right. and just saying to myself well okay how do you evolve how do you adapt because right. i'm gonna have to Right, and you've got a writing, you know, background. Right. So I'm sure that yeah. that's been a good, a lot of opportunity for yeah. you as well. Do you I, see yourself 
writing and creating shows yeah. and movies and, and films. That's so it. so I actually uh, at the end of 2019 created a I wrote on a show created by Chris Bosch. So he had an idea for a show. Is it called uh, the, the Out of Out of Left Field? field. Out of yeah. Left Field. Okay. So yeah. he had this really great idea uh, about his life post basketball with mm. retirement and what he's going to do. And he's a really brilliant music producer. And a lot of people don't know really? that. Oh, my God. He's really talented. Wow. Well, he's good at everything. He's like one of those guys who's good at everything. Right, and you're right, like, right. how the fuck are you good at everything? Shout it's out not, to Chris Bosch. Yeah, shout out. <laughs> <laughs> so he had this great idea. And he was talking to my wife, his first cousin, and me. Yeah. And he's like, what do you think about this? And my wife started floating some ideas to kind of make it this scripted narrative show. Wow. And he was like, I love it. Why don't you guys write like a treatment? So we nice. wrote a treatment. He liked it. And he's like, let's shoot. Uh, eight wow. or ten episodes so wow. we did that in uh, in California Miami we filmed it and then we put it out on YouTube recently right when quarantine hit wow. so it's out on YouTube out of left field check it out it's awesome that's dope yeah and you can check out his music now because he started his own record label called Daddy Jack Records what yeah and the, the fuck fir first single my friend DZ Brown it's amazing wow yeah I'm telling you like I'm not just plugging the family right, right, like right. He, this is legit wow yeah it's really good so he produces the music yes. himself he, does, he doesn't rap I'm making the music no he doesn't rap he produces okay, the music okay. like he's I was waiting yeah. for that I was like let me go and see no. this no you know how a lot yeah. of athletes are, or <laughs> actors or rappers uh -huh. he's not a rapper he's right. a music producer that's dope yeah he's real that's good dope. well it's good man I feel like mm -hmm. anytime you can find something that you enjoy outside of your usual yeah. you know mm -hmm. thing then it's then it's, then it's dope it's yeah so it's fun to write that and work on that and I got a couple other things in the works hopefully try to sell some scripts make some things happen oh yeah. shit yeah. you better pencil me in one All of right. them bitches you better pencil me in hey somebody dope. give me some money to make it and I'll, <laughs> I'll pencil you in there it is yeah. there it is man well dope bro oh, yeah. man I'm definitely excited for you man Thank you. and Appreciate I'm looking forward it. to all that you uh, are gonna do Me in the too. future, man. Yeah. So, uh, is there any uh, thing that you want to plug? Lastly, or if not, definitely let people know where they can follow, where they can support yeah. you, and see things, more things. Ben Mel. Yeah, you can check me out on Instagram. How lame does that sound? That's I what everyone. That's, I the, that's what I'm it is. Like, right. yeah, check me out on the uh, <laughs> the social media. Yeah, right, no, right, right. on Instagram, it's Benny on the gram, and uh, same on Twitter, and that's yeah. it. Nice. Yeah. Just like that. Follow yeah. and, and Amazon uh, Laugh After Dark season hey, three coming soon. Coming soon yeah. to your living room. Yeah, yeah. Super dope, man. Thanks for having me, man. Hey, man. Thanks Appreciate for coming. Yo, cheers, it. bro. Cheers. Let's get it in. Tasty ass beer. Hell yeah. <laughs> hey, y'all know how we do it every time. It's been a pleasure. I've been your boy, Charlie Wilson. Shout out to Ben Mel. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much for tuning in to Do Tell with Laugh After Dark. We'll see you next time, baby. Look at y'all out here tuning in. Ah, oh, thank you. I, I see. No, I see you. <laughs> yeah, make sure now, before you leave, make sure you like it, you follow it, and you subscribe it. Probably got some spit right there. You know what to do, though. It's Laugh After Dark.